You know, sometimes when you're hearing someone speak or even listening to a podcast, you think, if, if I was talking to them, here's what I'd say. And then they'd say this and I'd say this. Like you sort of have these fictitious arguments in your mind, but actually just sit there and consider. Like what, what is, there, is there a part of what they're saying is that's true? And the reality is everyone has got a perspective that even if there's a tiny bit of it is worth considering and it'll sharpen your thinking. We'd like to think that seeing is believing, but it's just not. Like as humans, we, we tend to see what we want to see and believe what we've already decided is true. I feel like stubbornness is like pride. Like you can spot it in someone else a mile off or arrogance. You can spot it in someone else. It's really hard to detect in ourselves. Um, bigotry never stands the test of intimacy. You know, this idea that like you can have a really fixed idea about someone and what they think and why they think it and who they are. But when you meet them and get to know them, it's amazing how they become far more three-dimensional. Stubbornness resides in the instinctive mind. And you look at most government campaigns, most health campaigns, most of our conversations when you're trying to influence someone, you're using the tools that speak to the inquiry mind. You're using data and evidence and pie charts and rational reasons, but that's not where the, that's not the mind you need to change. It seemed from the book that, well, maybe this is just my own observation. Are people inherently less rational or less reasonable than previous generations? Because I, I don't know what it is about. Is it just a media illusion that people are believing really stupid things now compared to before? Or, or is it just a different flavor and now it's in your face? I feel like there's, there's an extent to which there are some people that are so far down the rabbit hole. You know, they've just hook, line and sinker, taken on board all sorts of um, misinformation. And it's such a part of their identity now that it's hard for them to almost... Um, see the world in a different way, which I think is just terribly sad. Like, have you have you ever interviewed Sander Vanderlinden before? I haven't. The name rings a bell, though. He's awesome. So his work looks a lot at um, what they call pre-bunking. So how do you get someone essentially prepared so they don't fall prey to misinformation? Mm -hmm. And so he's like his pre-stuff is incredibly good, but he said there are just some people for whom they've gone too far. Like they, their identity is now so enmeshed with misinformation and false belief. And a bit like Dan Ariely's chat, and I listened, I loved that chat you had with him. Like when people get to the point where they've now got status and this is their community and their sense of belonging, it is so hard to speak to that because you've got to unpick so many things. Like it's not just a case of getting them to think differently or consider a different opinion. You're actually getting them to, ha in some cases, walk away from their community from their sense of status like so i feel like we've just we've attached more of our identity to our ideas in this era maybe in the last 20 or 30 years than we had previously i think that's sort of unfortunately that's been a bit of a hallmark of this age yeah i i can i got a lot of emails about that but i definitely agree look if this show was about conspiracy theories or let's say let's pick one let's say if this show was about flat earth or if what a lot of people did during whatever lockdown stuff they took one conspiracy theory and they ran with it and their show that was getting a hundred downloads a month now gets a hundred thousand downloads a week those people they're never going to change their minds about 5g causing covid or whatever hill they died on that then made them a million dollars like there's just no way that they're ever going to change their opinion and yet pre-show you were mentioning I, I i guess i told this anecdote maybe during the Ariely chat there was a guy who said something online like, hey, Joe Biden won't be the president on, I can't remember what on inauguration day, but you'll see. And then inauguration day came and Joe Biden got inaugurated and it wasn't, Donald Trump wasn't magically still the president because of a secret. And I, I DM'd the guy and I was like, hey, I'm, I'm really curious how you're feeling right now because I know one of your main things was the storm is coming and Joe Biden's not going to be the president. And he goes, ha, what, you, what am I living rent free in your head? Like you just wouldn't address it. And I was like, actually, yeah, you really are. Like I'm, I'm genuinely very curious what you're thinking and what you're going through right now. And like, what are you changing? Are the goalposts going to move? Did you come around to the idea that this isn't real? And he just blocked me. That was it. No, no wanting to engage whatsoever because he would have had to think about the fact that he was like just wrong and that reality didn't match what he wanted. Yeah. I wonder whether, so if you'd had that conversation face to face, I wonder if he had had the same response. The reason being, so you look at someone like that, who is their identity is now rooted in a certain worldview. That's their status, their position in the community. 
they've got probably a lot of people around them who've mocked them, laughed at them, who've pretended to want to have a conversation, but actually they don't really, they just want to try and catch them out or make a point. And so I wonder that even like you actually approached that genuine sense. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. I'm actually like humbly open to like what your perspective is. I wonder if to him, he's heard that line so much so. So given to him in a disingenuous way, but like face to face, if you would actually get a feel for like, you're genuinely interested and curious. I wonder whether it would have simmered down. I think so much of what we see online, it just, it, it we lose perspective because people online behave so differently to how they, how they do face to face. And I love that insight. I think it's from one of Adam Grant's um, um, articles that he wrote for, I think it was the New Yorker. And he talked about the fact that um, bigotry never stands the test of intimacy. You know, this idea that like you can have a really fixed idea about someone and what they think and why they think and who they are. But when you meet them and get to know them, it's amazing how they become far more three dimensional and it softens. I think our view of them, our view of ourself, the way we engage with them. And unfortunately, I mean, and you've probably had this experience, like you, you see someone online and they are just the vitriol, the, the meanness online. Mm-hmm. Then you meet them, they're like, they're actually a really nice person. Like, what is that? Like, there's almost they've got two personas and the online somehow gives people this sense of license to probably engage in a way that they actually wouldn't normally and they know isn't constructive. Yeah. And doesn't even match their own values. You know, that's really that's that's really something and, and completely true. I love the idea that bigotry never can withstand the test of intimacy or whatever, the challenge of intimacy, whatever it was you said. It reminds me a long time ago, like in the 90s, I worked security at this this company in Detroit. And a lot of the people that I was one of the only white guys and usually the only white guy in the whole company, depending on who was staffed. And there, th- we had a large contingent of African-American people. Are you familiar with, with the Nation of Islam? Do you Have you ever heard of it? I've heard the term, but I don't know what that means. So no. it's like so it's not they're, they're So they're Muslim, but it's not like Arab b- people from, you know, Saudi Arabia. It's like uh, and I'm, I'm going to be a little off here because I'm going off the cuff. But it's like uh, African-Americans who decided, oh, w- our religion is Islam. They converted to Islam and they're pretty okay. strict about a lot of stuff. But one of the sort of unspoken or possibly spoken tenets of it is white people are evil and Jews are really evil. And, you know, so a lot of the the stuff they believed was pretty distasteful. And I didn't realize that. I just thought like, oh, I work with a couple of black folks and some of them are Muslim, like no big deal. And I'll never forget when like we're I you know, worked with them for so long and the they, they, the women like wouldn't interact with me even though I was a, a, their boss at some point, right? And then the, I was like, whatever, it's a religious thing. And the guys were really standoffish. And then over like months and years, they started to warm up a little bit. And then one day we were eating, it was like two o'clock in the morning and they were like talking about the Jews. And I was like, but I'm Jewish and I don't do any of that stuff. And they were just like, oh wow. shit, you're Jewish? And then it was like all over again. But then a couple of weeks later, the the owner of the company was like, I know that you, some of you have a problem with this, but you worked with him for years and you didn't care. And then you found out something about him that doesn't affect you at all. And it's changed the way that you've done. So he basically handed them their ass. And I remember one of the guys was like, you know what? It doesn't make a lot of sense that we hate people without any reason. It's true. And I'll never forget that because I I was so naive that I didn't even understand that. I was just like, oh, these guys are just really in a bad mood a lot. Probably work too much. I never understood (laughs) that they just really hated white people and they hated Jews. Um, So they they treated you differently once they found that out. Yeah, but then it was hard for them because force of habit was we get along fine. (laughs) Yeah. So like they almost had to remember to be standoffish and aggressive or like, you know, and I remember one time I gave the the guy's wife a ride somewhere to another location and she was initially like so standoffish. And then the next day I saw him, we were like laughing and joking around. And it was like she had forgotten to be a cold hearted, unfriendly, (laughs) Jew hating, you know, it's hardcore. She just forgot because it was bullshit. And I think she knew that. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is once you actually get to know the person behind like the brand or the tribe or the persona, like all that stuff starts to fall apart. Like all those really simplistic explanations for the way things are and who people are and why they do what they do. Like those simplistic things, they're very dogmatic ways we like box people. Like they do fall apart pretty fast if you're willing to actually engage honestly. The problem is people do such amazing intellectual backflips and like trapeze acts trying to figure out how can I still hold that belief 
but then update it with this experience. So for instance, they might've said, okay, well, we don't like people like Jordan, but Jordan's different. Right. So like, he's okay, but we still don't like, yeah. like, so it is amazing just the, the brain's capacity. And this is what I found fascinating in like writing this book. And like, there's so much great work done on this, the nature of delusion and how we delude ourselves really quickly. Like we, we negotiate with reality so quickly. And like, I love this great thing I came across. Um, so Daniel Gilbert, who's a um, psychologist at Harvard, he had this um, piece, I think it was in the New York Times, and he was talking about this no- notion of delusion. And he said, you think about the way we uh, approach our bathroom scales at home. So if you jump on the bathroom scales and it gives you the number you want to see, you, you jump straight off. Right. It's like straight off into the shower, get on with the day. It's a good day. But if that number isn't the number you want to see, yeah, what do you do? You get again. back off. <laughs> <laughs> you weigh yourself like, again. No, no, no. Like maybe I was putting too much weight on one foot right. or the other. 100%. Or you know, maybe the scales weren't sitting fat on the floor and they need to be recalibrated. Yeah, like we start to bargain with reality. It's almost like we, we, we'd like to think that seeing is believing, but it's just not. Like as humans, we, we tend to see what we want to see and believe what we've already decided is true. And so just all those dynamics mean that it's, it is – it's so tricky to try and engage people around issues because you've got to take all of that into account. There's all these other things that are that mean we're not just approaching it like a computer would approach, you know, solving a mathematical problem. And then yet deep down, I think we sort of we have this baked in idea that humans are essentially reasonable. And if you just give them an asset, enough evidence, enough logic, enough good reasons, eventually they'll see the light and change their mind. And it's, that's just not how the way it rolls. Yeah, no, it's not how it rolls. I, there's a lot. There was a lot of rationalization. It, it, same example, same group. I'll never forget, I, there was an event we were at that we were securing, and one of the guys, one of the Nation of Islam guys, was letting people in for money without checking them, which is extremely dangerous, because we're frisking for weapons, and he's letting people get in with who don't want to get frisked for weapons. Why do you think they don't want to get frisked for weapons? Sure, maybe they wanted to skip the line, but probably they were wanted to bring in their weapons. And I confronted him about this, and he went off on this weird tangent about how George Bush fed crack to the black community. 9-11 was an inside job. Therefore, he needs to make money. And I was like, what? What are you Jeez. even talking about right now? And I thought, oh, he's mentally unstable. Like, this is just nonsense rambling. Surely no one else here will agree with that because you can't really follow that. There's no logic. So I brought it to other other people. And I was like, can you keep an eye on him? He just said this and this and this. And then he's like, oh, well, they're, you know, he's right about that. And I was just like, oh, so this, they've been fed that story from somewhere else and they use it to rationalize like that was just like a thing they probably met about at one of their meetings or something. So then they all use that to rationalize theft and doing dangerous things or putting all the whole team in a dangerous situation. And I, 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 they ended up all getting fired because of course I told the head of the company that we're letting in weapons so this guy can make an extra $20 an hour or whatever. And he was like, okay, wow. well, that's not going to work. It's just so weird. So the, the, the rationalization is, is wild. It's like we can really do anything. We don't just, look, I'm as guilty as anyone else. I move the scale. I try to pee a little bit more and make sure I'm not wearing anything. Uh, you know, maybe like do some sort of weird ritual and step back on the scale, hoping (laughs) for a different number. And it's never happened, but I still do it every single time anyway. Yeah. But you're right. We like to imagine that making decisions or being convinced of something is like this logical linear process, but essentially we just make a decision based on what our intuition or our gut or whatever we want, the desired outcome. And then our brains, I think you you wrote it in the book, something like they play the role of of, of attorney. They rationalize whatever conclusion we've already jumped to in the first place. Yeah. I think what I wanted to look look at in the book too is this notion of what are the two different parts of our brain that it's almost like two operating systems that we work with in any given day, in any given moment. And the, the reality is we do have that part of our brain that is logical and rational and reasonable. And so I refer to it as our inquiry mind. It lives at the front of our brains, that frontal lobe, the most recent part of our brains to develop from an evolutionary standpoint. And it's like, it's really good at nuance and complexity and being reasonable. Problem is it takes a lot of energy, a lot of self-discipline to use. And so we just don't use it anywhere near as much as we'd like to think we do. So um, Zoe Chance, who's a researcher at Yale, so she'd suggest that part of our brain, that inquiry mind part, we only use for 5 to 10% of our decision-making and our, our perception formation. So where's the rest of our thinking happen? 
So it's in a part of our brain I refer to as our instinctive mind. So the instinctive mind is in that, if you want to look at the geography, like where does it live, it's in that sort of the limbic system part of the brain. So near the top of the brain stem, it's where, you know, we process emotion. It's where our tribal instincts live. It's where our fight and flight impulses tend to reside. And the problem with our instinctive mind is that it's super fast, it's very efficient, but it's prone to jumping to conclusions. And therefore it comes with so many of those, you know, the, the classical term is heuristics or shortcuts that we use as, as humans. But it also doesn't just rely on what's coming you know, as a brain impulse. It actually is incredibly sensitive to things like our gut. Like the, the brain gut connection thing is mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah, do you know like much about how that? Our gut, I've, the little bit that I looked at in the book, I'm like, this is a whole other thing. Yeah. So I'll probably come back to that in the next book, I think, because I think we're, it's still really new as well. Like it we're is. still discovering exactly how the gut works, like so how some of those those vagal nerves, those parts of, of, of our gut that do the thinking, how they interact with our brain. But also it feeds into sort of like bigger and almost metaphysical questions like yeah. where does the soul live? Where is consciousness? <laughs> right. That idea of like we're not just – brains roaming around in a body like there's something about you know when you walk into a room or a conversation you're like i've got a gut feel for this there's an intuitive sense that i sort of know what's going on because somehow i've picked up on stuff that i can't logically make sense of but it's it's data i need to pay attention to and so i think you know our instinctive mind we'd be silly to dismiss it and go like it's it's unreliable it's impulsive it's you know, prejudice and all the rest of it, because it can be those things, but actually often it's it's taking a, hu a very wide frame of view in terms of what's happening around us. And so typically we make the decision with our instinctive mind and then we look to our inquiry mind to back it up. That's when logic and evidence does play a role, but it's only to reinforce what our instinctive mind has already decided to be true. And so that's a tricky thing. If you're going to change someone's mind, the question is like, which mind are you trying to right. change? Because in most cases, stubbornness resides in the instinctive mind. And you look at most government campaigns, most health campaigns, most of our conversations when you're trying to influence someone, you're using the tools that speak to the inquiry mind. You're using data and evidence and pie charts and rational reasons, but that's not where the, that's not the mind you need to change. And so it's like, how do you speak to that instinctive mind? That's, that's the challenge. I also noticed that a lot of like the most persuasive fake news is often the, the stuff that were persuasive is probably the wrong word. The most effective fake news is the stuff that is highly emotional and that you can use as a cudgel against somebody else. Like you might see an ad, here's an online conversation and I'm making these numbers up, right? 73% of Republicans believe that you shouldn't have uh, a choice when, you know, to, to have a child. And then the reply to that is, oh yeah, well the Democrats sacrifice babies. And it's like, both yep. of those things are probably BS, but one of those things is making the other side look horrible and is enraging zealots and things like that. And the other one is just like a number. Uh, let's even yeah. if it is a number again that I made up. Right. And it is phrased in a certain way. And it, you can't really it's hard to get around that. So people write in all the time and they're like, how do I convince my uncle that Ba baby trafficking for the organs is not a problem you have to worry about in Ohio. And I'm like, you probably can't, right? Because yeah. a lot of what appears to be stubbornness or arrogance, it boils down to us just not knowing how decisions are made and how people are convinced. But yep. also, if somebody's just bought in whole hog on something like that, you can't, what's that phrase? Like, you can't, you can't logic your way out of something that you've emotioned yourself into. or It's like if you convince yourself emotionally of something, you can't reason your way out of it. It doesn't. It only works in one direction. That's exactly it. Like you can't reason someone out of a position they didn't arrive at by reason. Like they got there in a really different way. And so, I mean, that example is interesting. And I think this is where, sadly, the, the levers that get pulled – in fake news, but also just mainstream media on both sides or any 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 part of the continuum ideologically. Typically, we play to the things that the instinctive mind, it's like junk food for the instinctive mind. Like what does the instinctive mind love? Tribalism. It's me versus you. Simplistic binary narratives. It loves outrage. It loves fear because fear triggers that like we've got to do something quickly. We've got to react. And so nuanced discussions complexity doesn't really speak to the instinctive mind necessarily well. It can be a good primer for reflection, and we'll probably get to that at some point. But like, interestingly, in fact, um, one of the problems we see with the climate change debate, and I heard this put recently, the problem with climate change isn't that it's happening too fast, it's that it's happening too slowly. Because the problem is our instinctive minds are only wired to react to concrete, tangible, immediate threats. Mm -hmm. So if something is vague and nuanced and slow and hard to pin down, 
our instinctive minds basically don't pay any attention to it. And so you tend to see like the, those sorts of messages appeal to those instinctive mind, fear, outrage. We've got to defend ourselves and fight against an enemy. And in many cases, the enemy doesn't even exist. It's a figment of our imagination. I think starting with imagination is a useful one. So if you look at an issue like abortion, so depending on where you are on the spectrum, like what do you imagine the opposing side to be like? And typically they're really silly imagined things. Yeah, they so are. like you've got you know one one side imagining you've got all these uncaring white politicians who have no sense of what it's like to be a parent in need, has no have no compassion. I'm like, there might be some who are like that, but I bet there's a lot who aren't. And a lot of those who are, you know, really, you know, committed to like not you know, not allowing abortions easily. They, they give to charities. They care. Like, they're actually not evil people. But by the same token, you see people on that side of the equation who've got imaginations of the sort of people who fight for abortion right. rights that are way off reality. Yeah. Like, they're actually just not like that. And so this is where I think coming together and hopefully meeting each other in the middle, getting a sense that, like, the 2D trap, that idea of demonizing or deifying, like, you are awesome and perfect and flawless or you are enemy and the scum and a band of deplorables. Mm-hmm. Like when we label those things, it feeds into those binary narratives. It's not a reflection of reality and it means we don't think well. And yet again, mainstream media can play to that really well. And over time, it does so much damage to society because it speaks to all of our worst impulses as humans. Yeah, you're right. If you, I've had these types of conversations where I'm like, tell me who you think has, which group has the most abortions. And you get very various answers, but usually it boils down to, uh, I, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat this, like b- people, brown lesbians who get pregnant every week just so they can go get an abo- their weekly abortion, basically. And it's just like, not, wow, I mean, I'm yeah. exaggerating a little bit, but not really, right? Yep. It's like, you know, the person who needs an abortion is not like a blue hair, 35 year old woman who just loves going to get abortions. It's, it's like a 15 year old girl who whose life is about to be pretty much ruined because she didn't know how sex worked or got assaulted by somebody like when you you got to have to steal man the case the case study here you and if if you don't if you stereotype that it's just oh it's a bunch of it's a bunch of poor people that live in cities who have no morals then of course you're going to vote against something that they do that you don't like of course you're going to do that yeah i think that the tricky thing and i tried to really focus that from a research perspective is that that two that two areas of focus like how do you persuade other people but also how do you try and guard against yourself being stubborn yeah it's really easy to look at other people and say they're so stubborn it's very hard to look at yourself and say (laughs) correct that you're stubborn yeah or admit i feel like stubbornness is like pride you can spot it in someone else a mile off or arrogance you can spot it in someone else it's really hard to detect in ourselves and so we, we would like to think like we're super open-minded, like we're you know, really reasonable and fair. It's everyone else that's really stubborn and obstinate and pig-headed. The reality is that we can fall into these traps. And so I think one of the encouragements that I, I try and remember, remember for myself and then I try and, try and encourage people consistently is like, be, bear in mind, who is your brain rooting for? So that like in, in Aussie language, we talk about this word like barracking. So barracking is going for one team or the other. So who's your brain barracking for or rooting for? Because whenever you hear an argument, even if you're telling yourself, no, I'm, I'm actually really open-minded, I'd like to hear both sides here. I bet there is one side that when they land a point, you're like, yes, yeah. you know, yeah, that's it. Totally. I reckon they're right. That's the, as the feel of something right. And when, when the other side who maybe you unconsciously, subliminally don't agree or, or identify with, when they make a point, what do you typically do? You're looking for the loopholes. Yeah, but yeah, but what about? Like it's and so we we have these reactions that give away sort of where our prejudices lie. And so whenever I get to that moment, see one of my tells over the years is like the hairs in the back of my neck go up. Like I notice when I get into that, it's like a physiological response. It's you know, the term is like an amygdala hijack. So it's that part of our brain, that instinctive mind wanting to go on the attack or to go defensive mode. And so I've just noticed when I get into that mode, stop breathe like even last night we had so my wife and i had a friend over last night and we got into a pretty contentious topic and we went to like 11 30 at night last night talking about the nature of art and beauty like is any art just beautiful and valuable in its own right or does it need to be valued because it communicates something and helps other people and so my wife is an artist runs a theater company so she was like very strongly of like no just beauty for the sake of beauty and i'm like yeah, but we've been to so much self-indulgent theatre over the years. Like where I walk out and go, I feel like we were doing a favour to the people on stage by being there. Like it was for them, not us. And to me, I don't know, as a speaker, as a communicator, as a writer, like I'm so wired to this idea of it's got to be, if you're not adding value, 
shut up. Mm. Like, don't, don't, you, if you've got a platform, you've got to use that to be helpful yeah, and to well, serve and to give. I get that. I agree. And so we had this, we have this full de- de- debate last night about like, is there, is there any value in just art? Or beauty for the sake of it. And I noticed at one point, and I noticed like I'd done the dumb thing. I started to argue from extremes. And I'm like, that's when you know that I'm not actually engaging in this faithfully and honestly and fairly. I'm, I'm just I'm trying to make a point here. So I, the example I gave was, and we've had this one in the news here in Australia in the last few weeks. There was a woman who got a, a federal grant to do a performance art piece. And the performance art piece was her recording herself artificially inseminating herself. That was her <laughs> performance art piece. Okay. And she got federal funding to do this. And like, there's been a whole lot of outcry in the last you know, year or two because the funding was then um, rescinded and then she fought back and appealed it. And so to me, I'm just like, like again, what's the point? Like, and so even in that moment, I'm like, that's actually not a very good way to approach this discussion because that's arguing from an extreme. Yeah, it's the most ridiculous yet, like, example, which is why it made the news correct. in the first place. Yeah. Correct. And so like, I just even being mindful of that in ourselves, like what are the ways we don't approach issues and conversations reasonably and the, like the, the one of the big tells apart from like the hairs going up on the back of my neck is when I start to label and start to box people really readily like everyone that thinks such and such is I'm like that's that's never going to be true. Well, it's never yeah, going to be realistic. It's true. I have to also we, note we that I, when I talk when the example I gave with the abortion thing I want to make sure that people know that I also realize that not everybody who is against uh, abortion thinks of other people that way. Like, I don't want, oh, you said yeah. we're against abortion, we must be a bunch of racists. No, just yeah. the extreme yep. example that I was giving there was the case. I know plenty of people who are completely normal and are also against, are, are who are pro-life, and they it's they're that way for, like, religious reasons or something, not because they don't like poor people or whatever. So I don't want people to get that idea. Because you're right, it doesn't help at all. There were people who heard that, me express it that way, and they were like, Jordan is an, an idiot. I lost some respect for him. I can't believe he thinks that. You never do yourself a favor when you use those extremes. And you're right, when you, when you have to pick one of those extremes, it's basically like, I don't know what you would call it. It's not a straw man because it's a real example, but you're just sort of, you're picking like the absolutely most ridiculous thing because if you picked a normal mm. example, your argument wouldn't work. Correct. Yeah. And and you're actually not, you're not engaging reasonably. You're, you're trying to make a point rather than actually make progress in the conversation. Like if you're trying to make progress, you would have a conversation, the, the, the thing that you would raise would allow the conversation to move forward as opposed to like scoring a point. And I think that's one of the challenges when it comes to trying to change other people's minds is what's like, what's your posture going into it? Like what's your heart, your motivation in this? Because if you're going into win and to trounce the other person, even if they go, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I guess I should change my thinking. I bet they actually haven't. Like if they feel like they've been cornered or shamed or dominated like it's like I mean, it's Dale Carnegie like 101 how to win friends and influence people you know someone convinced against their will is of the same opinion still this idea of if someone doesn't feel like they've got a choice or they've chosen to change their perspective because they were able to get there in a way that like preserve their dignity and their agency their mind hasn't changed at all and so so much about you know, persuading other people is not about the, like the arguments we use and how clever we are. It's actually about the posture that the attitude we go into it with. And do we give someone the ability to change their mind without making them have, have to acknowledge or admit they're an idiot? Because that's so often we, we back people into that that's corner. Right. Yeah, you almost have to you, you almost have to admit or get the other person to admit that they're stupid in order for them to change their mind. So of course they're not going to want to do that. They're just going to hold on for dear life. That's the perfect example with the, the guy who thought that Joe Biden was secretly not going to be the president and it was going to be Donald Trump um, before the QAnon guy. I, I put him in a position by by mistake without thinking where he would have had to have essentially have admitted that he was a completely brainwashed knucklehead who believed some stupid crap he read on the internet and couldn't discern reality from fiction, or he could just hit the block button. And so of course he blocked me. Of course he blocked me. And it, 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 it didn't, I didn't even have to be mean to the guy. He just already felt stupid and was like, well, I don't like this feeling. Block. One of the dynamics that I think feeds into this, and it's a concept I refer to as like psychological sunk cost. And we all know like what economic sunk cost is, which is where you'll, you'll stick to a decision or a course of action that you know is not going to work out for you. You know, this is going nowhere. It's going south fast. But I've spent so much money or I've spent so much time already, I'm going to stick with it, even if it disadvantages, it disadvantages me. We do the same thing with our, our ideology and our psychology. So if I've got a worldview or a belief, 
that yeah, I've 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 heard or I've read something that's actually more accurate, more up to date, better information, may even serve me better, and I would do well to adopt that new perspective or mindset, or at least take that on board. But if I've spent so much time and energy and ego, like my reputation is now invested in this worldview because I've been a spokesperson for it, it's amazing how people will stick with an idea or a mindset, even if they know deep down that they're not right. And even if they know that a better op- that there's a better option that would actually serve them better, they'll, to their own disadvantage, stick with a mindset just because of that sense of sunk cost psychologically. So bearing that in mind, that, that changes the whole discussion about how you approach someone. Because unless you factor that in, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, the wisdom of Socrates will have no impact at all. Has, do you think our thinking has gotten worse since it seems like it, it, over the, throughout the course of history, we've never really had to make up our mind about so many things with the speed that we have to do it today. And we also have a ton of information that we can use to make those decisions of ver- wildly varying quality. So yeah. it seems like making decisions has actually gotten a lot harder. I mean, it, it, the classic example that I'm dealing with right now, or the most obvious example that I'm dealing with right now is, which school should I send my kids to? Well, should we commute to Palo Alto? <laughs> yes. Should we do this? Should it be the bilingual one? Should it be the international one, private, public? If you live in a small town 100 years ago, there's no choice. You send your kids to the school that's within walking distance or biking distance or whatever from your house because the other one is a zillion miles away in another town. So that's that. And now it's like, well, should you send them there? Oh, no, that one's full of conservatives. You don't want that. Oh, this one's full of liberals. You don't want that. Well, this is the one with all these Mm -hmm. other folks. You don't want him to be in that environment. And it's like, it's insane, actually. It's really difficult to make a decision because every choice is bad. Yeah. And part of that is a function of the way we've organized society. We are far more segregated around ideology. Like the, I'm trying to think of it was, there's a book called The Big Big Sort that came out a few years ago. I'm trying to think of the author now. And he looked at across the US how we've seen um, counties and, and districts become far more clearly one or the other in terms of Democrat, Republican. There was a lot more diversity. So you may well have in your street... You know, a third of the street just voted really differently to you, but you knew them and they, your kids played with them and you went to, you know, football together on the weekend and like all, all those sorts of things meant that you built relationships. So the polarization, that 2D effect of like demonizing, deifying, it just didn't stack up because you knew those people. Um, but even I think in, in Washington, that was the way it was. You know, people that were, you know, in Congress would often live in Washington and they'd go to like restaurants in the weekend with people from the other side of the aisle. They had relationships. Whereas as soon as people started to live back in their districts, there was that sense of, you know, this, the big sorting. We didn't engage with people from the other side anywhere near as frequently. So that plays into it. This idea that you tend to have far less swinging states or swinging districts. As far, everything's a little bit baked in now. So that just reinforces. It's like geographic, geographical echo chambers that we live in. And then we do it online with algorithms as well. So that just amplifies it. But to your point, I think one of the reasons we're so stubborn now is a function of the, mo- the the amount of content that we're exposed to. Uh, I think it was Michael Easter in like one of the interviews I heard of you with him and he said um, it's something like in, a, in an average day today that a, a human is exposed to more information than a human a hundred years ago was exposed to in a lifetime. Yeah. And that's so true. Like there is just so much we're exposed to. It is overwhelming. This fire hydrant of of information and ideas and perspectives and viewpoints but also there's the expectation that you'll make up your mind quickly about all those things. Like, which side are you on? Pick a side. You can't be neutral. Um, I think it was Marcus Aurelius that said, like, one of the greatest freedoms we've got is your freedom to just say, I don't have an opinion, and to hold to that. But that's almost unacceptable today. You've got to choose a side. And so because we've got so much information and you've got to pick a side, it's overwhelming. So you just tend to default to, like, what feels right. Mm -hmm. Or what do people like me think about this? We defer to those tribal instincts. And I think so... All of that feeds into, you know, this sense of overwhelm means we get really obstinate. Like, it's just too hard to think about everything. We can't take it all on board, so we just then defer to those tribal instincts. Yeah, I think you phrased it in the book, something like, most of us judge instead of think, because thinking takes a lot of effort and energy. And our brains are advanced, (laughs) but they're also lazy. Thinking, the extra work, the extra effort required. Deliberate thinking is a precious resource that we can serve, essentially, by using our instinctive mind instead. Well, I think the other thing, if you look at what's happening in our brains, it can lead to this. And this is some research done by the University of Chicago in the early stages of the pandemic. And I found this fascinating. They looked at how the physiology, physiology of our brain was changing 
due to lockdowns. And we'd had a theory for decades that actually the amygdala, which is that really powerful part of our instinctive mind that's very fight and flight focused, um, very you know, often trigger happy and get, you know, outrage happens quickly, um, driven by the amygdala. So what happened, what they discovered is the less social connections you have, the more isolated you become, your amygdala essentially shrinks and changes texture. And so when that occurs, so when your amygdala changes, that means you actually become more trigger happy, trigger happy more outraged. And is there any wonder that hmm. in the lockdown pandemic, you know, pandemic lockdowns where we just had less connection with other humans, yeah. like we, we're social creatures, we need to connect with other people. And yet we started doing so much on video calls or remotely, like there's something about being physically with others that just makes our brains function well. Like we, our brains are most healthy when we're connected. And so you think about people who, and I have no data to back this up, but I suspect those who are most strongly aligned to say conspiracy belief, I bet they spend a lot of time in discussion forums online, yeah. not with real humans. hundred percent. I think all of 100%. these things feed into it. Yeah. I, so that whole idea. Of- I would, I would love to see data on conspiracy belief and social circle mm. size or relationship yeah. maps or whatever you would call it, because I can 100% see that being the case. And you even see how that happens, I think Dan Ariely and I talked about this, right? What you you start believing in conspiracy, you push away your close relationships because they're all annoyed with you. And his Dan Ariely's thing was don't don't push them away because what they need is a bigger social circle. He didn't necessarily say why, other than we're the only people that can sort of keep them grounded to reality. We, you know, he wasn't out there with the uh, tape measure in the amygdala or whatever. But I, yeah, that would be fascinating research, wouldn't it? That would be because we all, we've all noticed everybody listening to this is like, yeah, during the pandemic, people lost their damn minds. That's one thing we can agree on. No matter where you are in the political spectrum, you know, the majority of people somehow online seem to have been off the deep end about 2000 uh, in about 2022 or whatever. This thing was sort of like in full swing. It was insane. I think the thing then you think about. So, like, I don't know how old your um, little ones or little Four one is. We've got an eight year old. So four and a half and two. So we've got an eight-year-old and I look at him and I, he's not massively into technology. I mean, ironically, before this book, the last four books I'd written were all about AI and robotics and where the world's heading from a technology standpoint. That's been my bread and butter stuff for years. Interestingly, I'm actually a pretty low-tech person myself and a lot of the technologists are. I mean, it's interesting how they tend to raise their kids with very little technology, hmm. but they create the devices that hook the rest of the world yeah, on them. Yeah. Um, and so we're pretty low-tech parents and I look at that and we're, we're trying to consistently be out engaging with people like for him because I just see even at a young age there's such there's such a tendency now to be isolated and on devices and you know, they're connecting with their friends but they're playing Fortnite you know, they're, they're, they're playing video games where they've got connections all over the world it's great friendships and isn't it wonderful how diverse our young people's worlds are now because technology's opened that up to them but that's not that's not a proxy it's not the same for having physical connections and the way their brains function and you fast forward that to say 21 year olds and I'm like I'm having conversations a lot at the moment with 21 year olds who are grappling with returning to the office or working remotely and some of the some of the research that I found really interesting is the number of Gen Zs who actually they are they are hankering to get back to the I office bet. they're they're isolated they're lonely um, and they realise to being in the office is essential for mentoring and apprenticeship. It's really hard to do that remotely when you're not building relationships with those you wanted to get mentored by. And so I think all of these things feed into it. Like I feel like we need we're social creatures, and the more we stick in our homes, doing video calls, disconnected from others, and then social media amplifies and blows up all of these instinctive tendencies of outrage and fear and us versus them you see how this starts to feed in this very dynamic. So I think some of the simplest solutions for dealing with that sort of polarization is just if we can try and encourage ourselves and others to connect and have meaningful connections more, the difference that makes for how our brains function is profound. Speaking of the office, you mentioned this shocking statistic in the book, which is that 40% of our professional time is spent trying to convince other people or get buy-in on decisions. Seems incredibly inefficient to spend half your day trying to get people to do the thing that you know needs to get done. That's crazy wild. It's crazy inefficient and wasteful. Yeah, it's. I think it also just speaks to the fact that so much of economic productivity and the drivers of what we do in our roles is just it requires us bringing people on board and enlisting support and selling our ideas and proposals. 
is we spend so much of our time doing it because that's just a fundamental thing that as humans we need to do. Like everyone's always selling something, selling an idea, selling a vantage point, a perspective, a possibility or a project, whatever it is. Um, the data I came across, and I, this, I only came across this after the book went to print, so it's not in there, but there was a study done by a crew at Cornell uh, a couple of years ago and they actually used a subreddit group to try and measure how effective people were in trying to persuade other people to shift their viewpoint. And, I mean, it's, it's a subreddit group of people who signed in and signed on to be a part of it. And so you'd present an idea and someone would argue with that. And then there was something like if you if you changed your mind, you have to put a delta, the symbol of a delta, oh, yeah. into the chat thread. So Changed my mind. So they had to... um. There you go. That's the one. So they, had to me- they tried to measure how many people's minds were changed. But I think before there were any interventions to try and tweak how effective people were, the headline stat, even amongst that group, was you were only effective in changing someone else's mind straight out of the gate 3 to 5% of the time, mm. So, which, which is not a great strike rate. No. So if we're spending 40% of our time trying to persuade or influence or just encourage other people to think differently and we're only getting it right 3 to 5% of the time, that that's, that's a worrying stat. And I think that's the reality we all feel that we're – Increasingly, in a position where we have to try and enlist the other the, the, the perspective, enlist other people to our perspective, and if we don't have the tools to do it, that's incredibly frustrating. And that was actually, I mean, the genesis story of this whole book and project was one conversation I had a few years ago, and I was speaking at an industry association conference, and I was the keynote speaker before the lunch break. And so I talked all about the disruptions and the technology that was coming down the line for this particular industry. And this is a woman who came up to me during the lunch break and she was the picture of exasperation. She was so frustrated. And she said, I get it. She said, I can see exactly what you're saying. In fact, I've thought this for a little while now. She said, but my biggest challenge is if we, in my organization doesn't change in the next five to six years, we are out of the game. Like we're, we're falling behind so fast. And she said, my biggest challenge is getting my leadership team on board with the need to change because they're so stubborn so fixed so sure about how the way we should do things the way the industry works and so I said well what have you tried to you know bring them on board and she told me the things she'd done and they were all the things that you should do like they she'd made a really compelling case she shared lots of data and a powerpoint presentation she'd given them all the logical even the economic reasons why they should change and they hadn't and I remember just walking away from that conversation feeling uh, inadequate like this idea of I, I, I didn't know what to suggest because I'm like, if you've tried that and it hasn't worked, that seems to be what all the books tell us. And so essentially that was the, the genesis moment of like this book was an attempt to answer that question of how do you, in those situations, whether you're influencing up, trying to influence your leadership team to change or influencing your team or just people around you to see the world differently, what actually works? And I think the thing that amazed me is how many of the things that work are sort of counterintuitive. They're not the things that we've assumed to be true for centuries. And we've only discovered some of this in the last few years. So that was a fascinating experience just going through a lot of that research. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. Yeah, it's it's frustrating when you hear about things like that. It, it reminds me of, of when I was in, I want to say third grade, or is either third grade or fourth grade, I wrote this little newspaper that I could print out on my Apple dot matrix printer. And nobody was that interested in it. So I invited my friend Mark, who was like this really good athlete and, and stuff. And I said, let's write this newspaper together. He couldn't write much of anything. He put like one story in there that was about basketball. It didn't really need it. And then... I said, oh, this is a newspaper that me and Mark made. And everyone was like, oh, cool. I want I want one. So we sold out. We, we printed up like 30. We sold them all. And my mom was like, you didn't need him for that. He didn't really contribute. And I was like, oh, yeah, he contributed all right. And, and it's the reason I'm telling you this story is because I think intuitively at that point in my life, I kind of understood what this person in the office didn't, which is you'd, her ideas were great. Her persuasion was 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 theoretically on point. But what she needed was to find the person in the office that everybody liked and have them come up with this idea instead of her. Yeah. And it's, it's um. It goes back to some of the basic stuff that's, you know, two and a half thousand years old. I mean, Aristotle's three foundations of rhetoric, like they ring true and they're still true. I say it was logos, ethos and pathos. 
Now, we're pretty good at logos and pathos. Right? We're pretty good at you know, speaking to those logical faculties and giving good reasons for change. We're relatively good at pathos in terms of like trying to bring people emotionally on the journey. Although, interestingly, in the book, I found some fascinating research about how most of what we do to try and speak to people's emotions about, you know, say, giving to charities or feeling compelled to change with, say, sustainability – they don't work in ways that surprised me. Like we actually, em- empathy doesn't scale well, for instance. So if you're telling a story, tell one story in rich depth. If you tell the story of four, five, ten people, a village that's at risk and you know, give money now, the moment you scale empathy, it loses its impact. Our instinctive minds don't have the ability to in- empathize with scale. So it's like one person only. So that was, I found that interesting. So pathos we're relatively good at, but it's the ethos, ethos piece that your friend Mark bought. So like, what is ethos? Ethos is argument by credibility. You know, it's about the ability to build affinity, to bring people on board and make them feel they, they like you and they're on board with you before they get on board with your ideas. And so, so much of persuasion is about winning ethos. And the tricky thing with ethos is you do not own your own ethos. Ethos is in the eye of the beholder. It is in the perception of other people, of how credible you are, how trustworthy you are, how likable you are. And so... A lot of that is about realizing you need to communicate in a way that's going to engage the other person, bring them on board, rather than just rely on either speaking to the brain or speaking Mm -hmm. to the heart. Like that ethos, Pete, is is, is just as important. Yeah, it's it's wild what our brains will do to conform to tribal thinking or group thinking. Yeah. It's like group think. The social pressure angle is much more persuasive than evidence. And our brains will believe the group think kind of regardless of evidence, I think. And and you, you mentioned in the book, most people would choose to talk to a stranger who shared their views than a friend who did not share their views, which is actually kind of scary. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Yeah, that was a study from the University of Calgary. And I thought, doesn't that just speak to the the challenge of our age? Like this notion of like a friend who I don't agree with, I don't want to spend time with, but if I don't know you, but you're on my team. Yeah. And I think that's, it, I mean, what a sad indictment on the fact that we tend, tend to feel most comfortable with people who, are just like us and who make us feel comfortable about our views who don't challenge our views. And yet, how does progress happen? By butting up against people who've got a different perspective. And, you know, it's almost like if you think about the you know, the, the the metaphor of glasses, like you take your glasses off and put someone else's glasses on and go, man, I've never seen the world from this perspective. Like that's, that's where learning, that's where discovery happens. And what that requires, of course, is humility. I think the challenge is we, we humility is so often lacking. That's, that's the... The, the prerequisite for changing your mind is being willing to go, you know what, maybe there's a perspective I haven't heard yet. And how do you then encourage other people to <laughs> embrace the posture of humility without saying, you should humble yourself, be more open. I mean, that's never going to work. So right. like, but how do you give people the space and the permission and the encouragement to just think again, to be willing to consider there is a possibility that's different to the one that they may have held for a long time? The way you phrase this in the book is identity trumps inquiry. So we're always on the lookout for signs that somebody is like us or maybe that they're different than us when they are making an argument. And logic only comes into play after we make a decision about whether or not this person is similar to us. So basically, are you in the tribe? If so, I'm open to hearing what you have to say. Maybe I'll even agree with you. If you're not in the tribe, I maybe don't even want to hear it. I automatically disagree with your your ideas. Yeah, and the story that really highlighted this for me was um, there was a a guy named Ben Bowling who was giving the commencement speech um, at a school in Tennessee. And this was during Trump's presidency and this is sort of Trump heartland. And so he got up to give the commencement speech. And um, he said, you know, like like so many of these speeches, I'm going to start with a couple of quotes that I found on Google. And so he shared a couple of quotes that he'd just come across inspiring, you know, reach for the stars type quotes. And one of the quotes was, you know, um, fight for a seat at the table, but don't just fight for a seat at the table, fight for a seat at the head of the table. In other words, you know, young people, we need, we need your voices in the world in the future. And, and he said, you know, who said that? Our president, Donald Trump. And everyone applauded and went crazy. And they said, oh, sorry, no, I'm just joking. It was actually Barack Obama who said that. <laughs> and there was silence. And in fact, a few people booed. Like this very thing that they had just cheered about 20 seconds earlier now is like we, we vehemently disagree with because <laughs> the enemy said it. And you think, oh, no. like, wow, isn't that extraordinary? And this, there was a piece of research done by a university here in Australia at La Trobe University is the name of the, of the group. And La Trobe University did this with a series of people who they got to listen to a stand-up comedian. So they put them in a sound booth. 
um, headphones on, listening to a stand-up routine, and it was a one-way one mirror, and they were telling each of the people who were going through, it was quite a large sample size, they said, we're going to just monitor your reactions to see how you react to what you're hearing. So the first group that went through, the first cohort, all they heard was just the, the audio of the person giving stand-up. No other sound, and so they measured how much laughter, the intensity, the frequency of laughter. The second group that went through, they added a canned laughter track on top, um, no particularly significant thing because obviously that meant people laughed more. We've known for decades that canned laughter makes us laugh more. But where it got interesting is the next cohort that came through, they sort of split. And so for some of them, they said, hey, so the, the laughter track you're going to be hearing is of a live audience. And that's a live audience of, and essentially people like you mm. in a setting that you'd probably go to. They would vote like you. They think like you. Whereas the other group, the fourth group were told, okay, the people you're hearing laughing were, this was, this was a stand-up comedy set at X, Y, and Z event. In other words, people that are not like you, don't vote like you. And the level of laughter, so if it was someone who, if, if you ascribe the persona of people like you to the laughter track you're hearing, the laughter increased even more than just a standard, um, a standard kind of laughter track. The fourth group, though, if you, what you heard was people laughing who you were told were not like you, you basically stayed still. You didn't respond. The people didn't laugh. In fact, the level of laughter was less than the very first cohort where there was no canned laughter at all. And it goes to that thing of like, if people who are not like me are finding this funny, well, I won't find it funny because that's just not what I do. And so you see how these tribal instincts play into so much of, of the way we reason and think. And therefore, when you're presenting an idea to someone, trying to persuade someone, you need to realise one of the first lenses they're looking at it through is what do people like me think about ideas like this? Before I even engage with whether I think it's a good idea or even whether I trust you or whether I think what you've suggested is is reasonable and well-researched, like what do other people like me tend to think? And that social proof piece is massive. Yeah, that that that's so interesting. That's one, super interesting too. I, I also, I'm sitting here thinking, I would have fallen for that Donald Trump, Barack Obama quote thing because I'm sure you could get me to cheer for something <laughs> that I agreed with and then be like, oh, wait, Hitler yep. said that. And I'd be like, oh, yeah. well, I don't like that guy, but <laughs> yes. now I feel awkward yeah. about liking this thing that he said, even though I'm sure it wouldn't be related to anything like like what comes to mind when you think of Hitler. So I don't know. I, that, that one's... A, do they disagree with the comment or do they just not like the source? Are they booing the source? It's tough. Uh, more, a more sort of apt example might be the, the vaccine comments from Democrats and Republicans, and they sort of flipped them. And they, they just said, oh, leading Democrats said this. And then other people agreed with it, even though it was actually something a Republican said. And they were, it's just like they just agreed with it based on the source. That, that's also problematic, but totally understandable from a human nature perspective. Yep. Yep. And so the herd instinct, while it's incredibly powerful, it can backfire if you don't use it well. So those those sort of social proof things. And like even I was listening to a whole pile of episodes of, of your podcast the other week when I was getting ready for this chat. And I noticed how you use that whole herd instinct thing. I think like when you go to one of the sponsor sets, you say, do what other considerate and thoughtful listeners do. I mean, like, and it's, and so I listen to it, I'm like, genius, like that it, there's a reason it works. So there's a reason those sorts of things where you, you're you calling out either unconsciously or in some cases quite consciously what others are doing. And so therefore the message is do the same thing. But at that, so this can backfire though. So one of the things I found interesting was a study where the New York Metro were trying to deal with fare evasion. And so people weren't paying their fares. It was costing like $300 million a year in lost revenue. And so they're trying to figure out what to do about this. And so they you know, had a whole public, in public campaign about don't, 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 don't evade your fare. You know, you need to pay your fare. In fact, here are the, the punishments if you don't. And they flooded the network with enforcement officers. The rate of fare evasion went up from something like seven and a half percent of people not paying their fare to like 9.4% or something like that. And so it had the opposite effect. And so they started to look around the world, where were other jurisdictions finding they were having success in dealing with this issue? So there were two cities. So one was Melbourne here in Australia and Dublin. And these were the two cities where they had actually had success in addressing fare evasion. And one of the guys who ran the program here in Australia in Melbourne that you know, had, had caused the success of the, that decline in fare evasion rates, he said, the problem is when you call out how prominent and prevalent an issue is, it unconsciously sends a message to others that everyone else is doing it, so I may as well too. And he said, if you focus on the fact that like 94% of people pay their fares as opposed to the fact that 6% of people don't, the, it flips it. It makes a huge difference in terms of how that social proof is communicated. And so that like made a massive difference here in Melbourne. And I think once they implemented New York, the same experience there. Does it work even if you're conscious of it or did you just ruin my persuasive line to get people to support the sponsors? <laughs> I hope I didn't ruin it. But I think, 
I think it actually, even if you know it's there, it's, it becomes that unconscious cue. Mm-hmm. That like, you know what? Yeah, I, I ought to do that. It's the right thing to do. People like me. Right. That's what we do. I mean, and I think that's that's the secret. I like it. The best the best looking listeners support our sponsors. That I know that's true. <laughs> I got data on that. I'll uh, be sure to supply that at some point. So, yeah. Um, another thing that I find fascinating that I see, pl- I'm sure we all see play out all the time, is being good at thinking or being smart or being intelligent, whatever. Often, actually, just makes us better at rationalizing existing beliefs. So. Many people, and I'm sure I'm included in this bucket, right? We, we assume like, oh, I'm good at thinking. I'm good at rethinking. But really the skill is rationalizing after they've made a decision without thinking. And if I'm really honest with myself, a lot of times I'm doing that. I'm like, no, no, no. I came to this through careful consideration. Well, actually what happened was I really wanted this to be true. And then I did a really damn good job of convincing myself that it was. Yeah. And I think the, 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 the key point in that is how widely have you cast the net intellectually? Like if you've only ever read the journal articles or the newspapers online that, that you know will be safe and will support what you already think, you go, well, I've, I've read 12 articles. Well, you, you have, but they've all basically been from the same well ideologically. Have you read something that is completely different, that is out of the box, that even challenges your thinking? Um, in fact, there was a, an Ohio State University study that found that we spend 36% more time reading an article if we already agree with the premise of the article. It's like we tell ourselves, okay, even if I'm going to read an article, but I'll just flip through it. I'll just skim it quickly. And so I think bearing in mind those tendencies, I, I try and force myself to sit in the uncomfortable, like to sit in articles and perspectives and read books and listen to people who I've really disagree with, but not to try and pick holes or not even try to imagine my arguments. You know, sometimes when you're hearing someone speak or even listen to a podcast, you think, if, if I was talking to them, here's what I'd say. And then they'd say this and I'd say this. Like you sort of have these fictitious arguments in your mind, but actually just sit there and consider. Like what what is there? Is there a part of what they're saying is that's true? And the reality is everyone has got a perspective that even if there's a tiny bit of it is worth considering and it'll sharpen your thinking. And yet that is uncomfortable. I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes put it well. He said, like, it's very it's the rare person who wants to hear what they don't want to hear. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't really want to. No. I don't enjoy listening to dissenting views and things that make me feel uncomfortable, but I try and force myself to do it. And then bear in mind, you know, that feeling you're having right now when you're suggesting your view to someone else, remember that's how they're feeling. And try, trying to change someone's mind isn't just about taking on a new belief or a new perspective. It's abandoning an old one. And I think one of the key things that... I loved exploring in terms of the research was looking at what is that, what are the dynamics that cause us to feel threatened and feel defensive? Because we've been told for years that, you know, humans are inherently afraid of change. That's just the way we are. And I've said that for years. I've written about it in books. And yet the most recent research from a neuroscience standpoint, we indicate that's actually not true. We're not afraid of change. What we're afraid of is loss. So the moment there's a sense of loss, i.e. I'm going to lose dignity, lose power, lose certainty, that's when we dig our heels in, even if we, we deep down know that the idea being suggested is a good one. And so then the question is, how do you, rather than trying to upsell the benefits of change, how do you lessen the loss? How do you make sure that the sense of loss is not so great? And so if you check yourself, when you're listening to someone reading a book, um, you know, taking on board an opinion that you don't like, what is it that you're afraid of? It's not changing your view. It's the fact that you might lose certainty. You like certainty. Like, I know how world, I know how the world is. I know what I think. This is clear. And in a world of uncertainty and turbulence and change and disruption, that's there's something really safe and appealing about that. And so just bearing in mind that, okay, I don't have to change my view by reading this, but I just want to take it on board and just consider it. Hold it lightly, and I might put it down at the end. Mm. But I don't have to take it all on board because that gives you that sense of, of safety that means you can you can consider it without feeling threatened because that, that feeling of loss, of feeling that we'll lose certainty or power or dignity, that's what tends to cause us to be stubborn. Speaking of stubborn, a lot of the consequences of this are also very real world. You mentioned in the book how science breakthroughs are often somewhat obvious after the fact. And all the evidence that was needed was previously available, but somebody had to see it with fresh eyes and less bias. And I can't remember the exact quote, but maybe you can help me. It's something like, Science moves forward one funeral at a time, and it's because the person who had the opposite idea literally has to just die first, and then it's like, okay, fine, now we can finally entertain the idea that the earth doesn't, yep. the sun doesn't revolve around the earth or whatever. 
And these and these are this is amongst scientists, the people who should be best at reconsidering right, exactly, seeing things yeah. differently. Like, the people who th- claim to be even, immune from this are the ones that we have to wait <laughs> until they die because we can't persuade them. Correct. I mean, it's interesting. So we um we were in London in July this year, and um, we wanted to go see like a show if we could, and they're hard to get. I mean, man, shows are so expensive in London at the moment. I mean, you're talking about like, like a Broadway just, or whatever the equivalent is of London. It was like play. a live theatre show, yeah. so I think it was something like the cheapest we could get was 190 pounds each or something, and it was like for the worst seats in the house. Anyway, and they were pretty, pretty much sold out. But we found this one show. My wife found it. I'm like, yeah, just go for it. Get yeah, you know, book it. We, if there's only a few seats left, we'll get them. We were sitting separate, in fact. That's how few seats oh, wow. there were. And then I found after she'd booked it, she told me what it was. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. This actually couldn't be a better show because the show was all about like a guy that I r- profiled in the book who I found fascinating. And this 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 play was all about his life. So he was an 18th century Hungarian doctor named Ignaz Semmelweis. So Zemmel, Semmelweis was basically the dude that figured out the fundamentals of germ theory. So he realised that the the more, more you know, that the death rate of babies being born for doctors who had been working in the morgue before they went over and delivered the babies was much higher, whereas the midwives who delivered babies in a different wing of the hospital had you know, dramatically less births of people of babies that had just been born. And so he, over the course of you know many months, less de- figured fewer this deaths out. of babies who had just been born. He said fewer far births. fewer. That would have made no sense just for fewer those of you deaths. following along at home. Yeah, <laughs> for all the detail people. Um, yeah, and so he figured this out. He then tried to present, you know, to the global assembly of doctors that this is, you know, they had this series, series of things each year in Europe where they bring all together the latest research, the latest findings, and challenge them that they needed to wash their hands in a solution of chlorine before they went in to deliver babies. And the pushback, because these doctors said, "What are you saying that we're killing?" the babies of our patients. So yeah, they were threatened by it. The problem was, and this is where the play was fascinating, it gave you a real insight into Semmelweis's view. He was so strong-willed and indignant and had contempt for people who didn't agree with him that he just put them offside. And so he then spent the rest of his life trying to fight for this change. It never happened. And it wasn't until like 85, 90 years later that Louis Pasteur realised what germ theory was and that changed the world. But Semmelweis, I mean, think about the millions of lives that could have been yeah. saved in that preceding 80 years. But it was because people were unwilling to consider, unwilling to think. Part of it was the messenger. I mean, the, he, he shot himself in the he foot was like, so no, many He was times. notoriously kind of a prick, right? Wasn't that the consensus? Yeah. Yeah, like initially he's like he just wanted to just usher through change. Then it became part of his identity, and he was against the you know, the, the establishment, and he called them all you know, essentially murderers. And so that's never going to go well. People don't like hearing that. And so it's interesting how like that that whole the way that play f- unfolded gave you a real insight into just why he was so profoundly ineffective in persuading those around him, and then the hu- the true human cost of this. So yeah, I mean, science progresses one funeral at a time, and that was a perfect example of exactly that. You have some some of these sort of quick hit persuasion or I don't even know what you'd call it, like psychological vignettes that I just loved in the book. There was one about expectations and perception. And you use the I guess this is an experiment where they put a violinist in the metro. Can you take us through that? This is so interesting because I think we do this to ourselves all the time and we just are completely unaware of it. Yeah, so this is a violinist who they planted um, in one of the metro stations in Washington, and he had just played a concert the night before where you know, tickets were hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars. And so there he was playing an exquisitely difficult piece of music. And I think actually Dan Ariely was one of the people who ran this experiment um, in conjunction with the Washington Post, I believe. So they basically put him there to watch how many people would stop, listen, and donate. So because he was there as a, as a busker. And so because he appeared to be a busker, no one paid any attention to him. Here he was playing a piece of music that the night before people paid hundreds of dollars for and there was a standing ovation. I mean, it's one of the most difficult pieces of music to play on the violin. And he was actually playing a Stradivarius um, violin. I mean, we're talking like millions of dollars for this instrument, but because he was in the basement of a metro station and because he's wearing a baseball cap and, you know, and casual clothes, no one paid any attention at all. And it's almost like that idea that we, we see what we expect. And so in so much of life, Altering people's expectations and change, and shifting people's perceptions is often the it's the precursor and the term they often use in the in the research is the primer. That's what gets people ready to see things from a different perspective. And so there's lots of ways you can do that. But I really like that example because in fact there were over the I think it was playing for 45 or 50 minutes there were only like three or four people who actually stopped and only one person who recognised him because she'd been at the concert the night oh, before wow. and she stood there like 
aghast, like, what is going on? And she, she was but, thinking yeah. how she paid six hundred dollars to go see him the previous <laughs> night, and how annoyed <laughs> she was that right. here he was in her commute to work for twenty five cents. Correct. Correct. And it just it does speak to that point that so much, so many of those things, and they are unconscious signals of you know whether something is true or worth considering or valid. They can make a huge difference. Whether the message is right or wrong, the way we present it um, and the way we prime people to be ready for that, to shift their expectations. Sometimes it's about catching people off you know, off guard by surprise. Sometimes it's about using metaphors and make people go, oh gosh, I've never actually thought about that in that way before. I heard this interview recently with Paul Sloan, who's done a lot of work around lateral thinking. And he used a great metaphor to set up the reason why even people who are highly intelligent and smart leaders, why they need to think differently. And he said, think of it as if it's like, you know, if you're an expert tennis player, but all you can do is hit the forehand. If you've got a really weak backhand, you'll get so far as a, as a tennis player, but you'll never be world leading because there's going to be times where you need a really solid backhand. And he, he talked about lateral thinking being like the backhand. He said, you may be really good at being strategic and strategic thinking and linear thinking, even being persuasive as a thinker and a leader. But if you can't do the lateral creative thinking, it becomes a weak point. And just that metaphor, because I imagine when I was listening to him being interviewed, there'd be a lot of people who are like, yeah, but I'm really good at the, the way I think right now serves me well. And I'm getting great results in my business or life. But that metaphor just allowed people to go, oh, you know what? Even that this is not saying that what I do isn't valuable and I'm not really good at it, but I also need other things just to make me more well-rounded as a thinker. And I think it's like setting people up to be able to consider a perspective you know, that's different to theirs. I think that's that's where the game is at. And that's, I mean, the, the whole thing of relativity and framing and priming, these are all often very simple things, but they can make all the difference in terms of how persuasive we are. I would love for you to teach us a little bit about priming. You know, you mentioned that we can ask them a question that primes them first. That seems like a pretty powerful and useful skill if you can teach it to us. Yeah. So there's a couple of ways to use questions that make um, a big difference. I mean, and so one of the tools that I found most effective in the book, and I've used it personally in life as well, is um, what it's often referred to as motivational interviewing. And I first came across it in some work from a guy named Michael Pantalon, who's based at Yale. And so they've used this in a therapeutic context for decades, trying to deal with drug abuse and alcohol abuse, trying to change people's perspective. What they've discovered is those that idea of having an intervention where we get all your family and friends together to essentially shock and shame you often backfires. And so they've been looking for different ways to try and get through to people. So the, the motivational interviewing technique, I call it the rate and reflect process because it's a bit, bit less of a mouthful. But um, basically it's about asking two questions in, two, in a specific order. And so the first question is, okay, I'm just curious from like one to 10, how open or willing would you be to, and then fill in the blanks, you know, and you want to, whatever the idea or the perspective you're trying to get them to consider is. And typically if you're dealing with somebody who is stubborn and doesn't want to change, they'll give you a low, they'll low ball it. They'll say like two or three. Sure. But it's the second question that's the key one. And it's the question of, okay, so I'm just curious, how come you didn't give a lower number? And in that moment, hmm. It flips the entire conversation. Now, you've got to do this sensitively because if it feels like you're techniquing someone, right. like, I mean, there, there are some environments where like asking someone to rate one to 10 is just going to feel super awkward. Like it's just not going to work. But I mean, I, I found this recently. We we're catching up with some mates and um, so one, we're just a group of lads away for the weekend, drinking whiskey on a Saturday night. And one of the guys in the group said, okay, lads, so how are your marriages going? Like one to 10. I'm like, oh, that's serious. There we go. Let's strap in. So we sort of went around the group and everyone gave a number and just like, how's life going? Let's be honest and vulnerable. And that's the nature of this group of lads. We've been mates for years. One of the guys, in fact, the last guy around the table said, oh, if I'm honest, it's probably like a three right now. It's pretty rough. And he just sort of, and he started to get pretty upset. It was pretty full on, like just sharing what was going on for them. And after about 40, 45 minutes of talking about this, like it has sort of become this quite negative spiral. I'm like, well, we've got to figure out how to turn this thing around. Yeah. This is not going well. And so I thought, I'm, I'll just try this technique. I mean, I hadn't done the whole rate from one to 10. One of the other guys had suggested that. So I'm like, I'll use the second part of this technique. And I said, hey, so I'm just curious. I know you said you're like, you're a three out of 10. How come you didn't give a lower number? And in that moment, the whole, it's like I was speaking to a different person who was in a different marriage. Like the whole conversational tone shifted. And I was like, well, there's some, like, it's not all bad. Like there's some stuff that's going really well. Like we are a great team as parents and like, it didn't negate all the hard stuff we just talked about, but in that moment, it shifted the entire conversation. It changed the frame of reference. So asking questions can be super valuable from that perspective. The other thing about priming, it can be as simple as the tone that you use. So if you're presenting an issue or an idea to someone, it can be as simple as prefacing it with a phrase like, you know what, feel free to ignore this, but 
or like just my, my sense is, or like I've just been thinking this. I'm I'm still not sure about. Like I'd I'd love to get your perspective, your opinion. Like you're you're prefacing that you're setting up a posture where that person's going to be open. They're leaning in now because you haven't got in going. This is the way the world is. I'd like to suggest why I'm right and you're wrong. Like just even prefacing things like that, and you can actually backfire. The conversation the conversation can backfire if you do that in an unhelpful way. Sometimes you can prime people to be defensive, like, hey, no offence, but, or everyone's been saying that, dot, dot, dot. Like the, all of those sort of prefacing s- statements get people on the defensive. So it's about asking questions or using language or some, in some cases metaphors that allow them to see the situation differently or just feel like they can engage openly and honestly and it's like a safe conversation. They're not going to be caught out or shamed or embarrassed. The power of sequence is something that you brought up, and I've seen this before where it's, it's like, oh, judges or parole boards or whatever that are, uh, what is it, that, that are, where they're hungry, basically, the person goes straight back to jail. I mean, I'm making <laughs> yeah. light of it, but it's actually really horrible and, yep. and, and shouldn't be yep. happening. Tell us about this, because it it's scary that there's so much that we allow. I mean, look, judge in a court of law, fine. Even judges on The Voice, right? The first person who goes, they get the harshest judging, and the people after that, are it's not even close. What's going on here? Yeah, so the se- sequence does make a big difference. Um, and so that study was a, of a group of German judges. And so what they were doing is they were given essentially a, a hypothetical case. And so the idea was if you know if someone who had committed this crime was brought to you, what sort of sentence would you give them? But before they were asked to give their estimated sentence, so at least in this case it wasn't a real person's life that was going to be impacted. But these were highly experienced judges, so given a very clear set of you know, circ- details of this particular theoretical um, a crime, but that to roll a dice. And the dice either had – it was a loaded dice would either land a three or a nine – and so what they did is they rolled the dice and then depending, and then they were to give the number of what they would see, uh, sentence this person to. And if, they, if people gave a three, their average sentence was something like five months or four months. If they rolled a nine, it was far more likely to be an eight-month sentence. And these were exactly the same. It was the same crime, similar level of experience of judges, but something about that number, the number they had rolled, primed them to respond in a certain way. So sequence in that instance can make a huge impact. And that's, again, a bit of a worry. But I think it's not just about, in that case, that, that that's an irrelevant anchor or an irrelevant primer. It's just a number that was rolled. But to your point, if people are hungry or fatigued, that can make a difference. And the other thing that I found interesting about sequence was what Adam Galinsky's done. And Adam is based at Columbia University. And he looked at the sequence. So if you're in a talent show or presenting a pitch, for instance, for VC funding, like what, what order in the sequence should you go um, to get the best result? And it is worse to go first, is the simple way to put it. And the reason is the people who go early in a lineup are being measured against the judge's ideal contestant, which is never going to be a fair a fair assessment. Because they're like, you know, in an ideal world, what would, what would the sort of person do? How would they approach this? How talented would they be? As you go along, their expectations going to be tempered by the field. It's like, hey, this is where sort of the average is. And at the end, you've also got the the law of recency effects, like the people who are in front of mind because they saw you most recently toward the end. So if you can position yourself toward the end of a competitive lineup, you will typically get a far better response. And so like all these things, they shouldn't make a difference, but they just do. And I think it'd be smart for us to bear some of this stuff in mind when we're trying to suggest our ideas. If you're putting you know a presentation together, don't put all your best ideas up front. Save some of them for the end of your presentation. Um, finish on a high. Because, again, some of those ideas will be most persuasive toward the end of the presentation rather than popping them at the beginning. You hate to think somebody went to prison for an extra three years because the judge had a ham sandwich that morning or something, right? I mean, that's that's, <laughs> that's really right. scary stuff, actually. Yeah, it is. And, and there was another study that was – I think this is – Probably one of the more quirky um, bits of research that I read, and I can't remember who did this study now, but basically they got people to do word um, exercises, they had to decode these word puzzles. And it wasn't about the exercise of decoding the word puzzles that mattered. It was the, the very nature of the word. So the two sets of words that people in this study were decoding. So some of the words were words like polite and patient and kind. So they were the words that they actually unscrambled. Others were impatient, frustrated, irritated. So the idea was at the end of the experiment, once you had decoded your little word experiment, you had to walk to the front of the room, find the researcher who was running the experiment, and um, and it, it, it await your next instruction. So the idea was, though, that researcher was actually speaking with someone else who was you know, planted there essentially having an intense conversation. So you had to wait for the researcher to be ready for you to butt in and say, hey, so I'm finished, what do I need to do next? 
what they found is those who had unscrambled the discourteous, rude, frustrated words basically butted in straight away. And those who'd unscrambled, unscrambled words like kind and patient, were, they typically waited, if not the whole, basically the idea was 10 minutes was what the researcher would speak to this person about. And at the end of the 10 minute mark, they would test. And most of those people who'd unscrambled the positive words and the nice words didn't interrupt at all for the 10 minutes. Some of them interrupted after the nine minute mark, but those who'd unscrambled the rude words, within a minute or so, like, I'm not waiting any longer. Hey, can I just butt in here? Like, it's amazing how even the unconscious priming of those words changed their behavior, changed their posture. There's there another study where they did different things. It wasn't about the nature of the words, but what they were doing is they were unscrambling words that weren't to do with character traits, but to do with age. So one, one group were um, you know, unscrambling words that were all about being elderly and old and frail. Others were about youthful and, and full of energy. Those who had unscrambled the youthful things actually measured how quickly they walked to the front of the room to find the the person running the experiment. And they basically walked briskly to the front. Those who'd, who'd done all the old words walked significantly more slowly than those who'd, who were in the other group. And something about just the words they were exposed to changed the way that they behaved and the way that they thought after that. So these things, some of them are a bit gimmicky, but it does point to the fact that this stuff really matters. And I think, I mean, going to your, the priming thing that you use for sponsors, like there's a reason that, I mean, the, you, I think the words are like, do it smart and considerate people do. I mean, those, those words, they become a primer. It's not just about social proof. It's actually about using words deliberately that will unlock the very thing you're hoping people to aspire to. So priming can work in some very weird and wonderful ways. Tell me about paradoxical thinking, exposing people to, to an extreme but maybe not absurd version of their beliefs and how that can actually help them re-examine those beliefs. I'd, I'd never heard this, but I have seen the uh, smoking kid campaign that you mentioned in the book, if you can tell us about that. This is, a, this is kind of a genius marketing piece. <laughs> Isn't it brilliant? So the idea is if you expose people to a view that is further along the continuum to where they're at, it creates contrast. So if you've got someone who's got a very strong view and then you expose them to a much stronger view of that, they suddenly realize, oh gosh, I would never think that because that's too extreme. And even in that moment, it unlocks them because they realize they're no longer at one end of the spectrum and you're at the other. Their spectrum goes beyond them. And actually what that means by definition is that they are moderate and reasonable. And that opens them to being more willing to consider different ways of thinking. So paradoxical thinking is an interesting one to use. So it's, it's almost like you expose someone to a stronger view and it doesn't strengthen their, their view or their mindset. It actually moderates it, which is the opposite of what you might expect. And the smoking kid one is interesting though. So this was an experiment that was done um, in Thailand. The Thai health authorities were trying to promote a quit smoking campaign that they had launched. They'd, uh, they'd launched a phone number where you could ring in and get advice about quitting smoking. And it wasn't really being used. And so what they did is they sent a whole lot of people out to hand out pamphlets to promote this particular quit helpline. Um, and so the idea was they'd go up and, uh, and the people would go up to random people who were smoking in the street and say, hey, can I get a light? And I mean, globally, that's sort of typically the thing that every smoker just complies with that request. It's just a, a given that, you know, if someone asks for a light, you help them out. And in this instance, what happens when the, when the individual rocked up into the, the people smoking and said, can I get a light? They didn't get a light. They got a lecture. They got like, you, you should never smoke. Smoking is so bad for you. You know, don't you realize if you smoke, you probably get, you'll likely get cancer. They have to drill a hole in your throat. Like giving these, these, these are smokers reasons telling why the other person this. The smokers. Like, and like the irony is they only stopped smoking long enough to deliver, deliver the lecture on why smoking <laughs> was bad and then you know, took another drag. And the reason this wasn't, you might thinking, well, how, how does that play out? The reason was those walking up to the smokers asking for a light were eight, nine, ten-year-olds, little <laughs> kids. And in that moment, what it did is that those who were smoking gave the lecture to the kid as to why smoking was a bad idea. The next thing the kid did was say, you know, you care about me. What about yourself? And they handed <laughs> them a slip of paper with this quit help line, help line phone number on it. And so that quit helpline, I think in the next 30 days, the traffic increased 32%. And it stayed elevated for the next six months while they were studying this. In other words, something about saying the very thing, the very advice that others had given them for years, but when it came out of their own mouth, they were far more willing to consider it. And it created that sense of contrast of like, wow, what I think to be true and what I'm doing don't line up. That sense of cognitive dissonance is often all we need to look for a way to resolve the tension and the awkwardness. And in that case, it was in the helpline. Probably a little bit of commitment in there too, right? These people are publicly stating their beliefs. Smoking is bad for you. It can kill you. It's You're going to have health complications. The odds are really high. And I think more people are 
people are probably more likely to change their behavior if they've publicly stated beliefs. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. There is something about that. And interestingly too, if you write down a commitment, so saying something publicly, you're more likely to to conform with what you've said you value, but if you write it down, it's even more significant. And a study that looked at that was one in Los Angeles with doctors practices to address over prescribing of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And that's a massive issue because doctors yeah. are just giving out far too many antibiotics and, and it's like the impact on drug resistance now is actually quite, quite significant. And so what they had done is they had asked doctors to sign a pledge that they wouldn't over prescribe antibiotics. Um, and in fact, some of the doctor's surgeries, they had multiple groups doing this experiment. Some of them were actually asked to sign that pledge and have it visible in the waiting room. And what they found is the doctors who'd signed this pledge and had it visible in the waiting room gave out 30 to 35% less prescriptions for antibiotics mm. when people walked in with the same symptoms. So people that walked into the doctors weren't really sick, but they had the same symptoms. But those who were, had gone into the practice where there'd been a public commitment, far less likely to walk out with a prescription for antibiotics. Because something about making that commitment was a primer. It, it set that person up to follow through with actions and behavior that were consistent with what they committed and said was important. I love the bit of advice to stop defining yourself by your opinions, because I think when when we mix opinions and identity, like we talked about at the top of the show, it's so difficult to change your mind because, again, you don't just go, oh, well, I was wrong about this thing. You basically have to be like, I'm a bad, I don't know, Christian now for not thinking this or a bad Jew or a bad Muslim or I'm a bad person or I'm stupid. You have to like make this sort of like really beyond self-deprecating conclusion about yourself in order to change your mind. And that's so uncomfortable. But that really only happens when your identity and your opinions are kind of melded, welded together. Yeah. And I think that's the trick in all of us is you are not your opinions and neither are other people. They are not the sum total of their opinions. And this is the tricky thing when you've got someone, and I can think of people right now who just frustrate me enormously because they're the people who... Hey, yeah, it may have gone down the rabbit hole of conspiracy belief, for instance, and they share stuff online that is just fundamentally not true and often quite destructive information. And in my mind, I just want to write them off. I'm like, well, how can you think this? Like, I know you're smarter than this type thing. Mm -hmm. But what, and this is the challenge thing. In that moment, I need to step back and realize that that person still has value, even if them, even if some of their ideas are dumb. Like, how do you, how you might lose respect for someone, but how do you not lose regard for them? And I think that's the challenging thing. The moment we're just willing to write people off because of the views they hold, firstly, there's an inbuilt arrogance in that, that idea that maybe maybe there's part of what I'm thinking that's true that's actually not 100% true and I need to be willing to reconsider that. So there's an arrogance there. But it also means that yeah, you lose the ability to learn from that person. You cut yourself off from relationship. I mean, to the conversation you had with Dan Ariely about conspiracy belief. What's the first thing that causes people to go down that rabbit hole of conspiracy belief is being ostracized, mm -hmm. being shamed, being embarrassed by people in their social group or their family or their friend network. And so I think there's something that's dangerous about when, we, when we're willing to write people off because of the opinions they hold. And even people who've got really crazy opinions are, just, are still valuable human beings. And I think there's something important about keeping that front of mind. And it changes the entire tone then of, of the conversation. Um, and it also hopefully limits the potential for the arrogance that can creep into that, that I'm right and you're wrong. I'm spot on, you're an idiot. And we so often see those dynamics play out. In the book, you have this genius little bit about using someone's ideological bent in order to persuade them. Can you give us a Democrat and Republican or conservative example of this? Because I think that this would be so useful for people on both sides of the aisle to, 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 put, to put into practice. So I think what you need to find out is what what is the core value of that person? So Jonathan Hyde would talk about this notion of, you know, the five moral foundations. So the moral foundations would be things like harm, fairness, loyalty, authority, purity. These are the things that typically they're they're the big ones that shape our view of the world. How do you how do you share your message in a way that resonates with that thing with that that way of seeing the world. So, for instance, you know, if you want to see, get a message through about making a social change, if it, if you're dealing with someone who, let's say, is Democrat or to the left of the ideological spectrum, you need to position that as being an issue of fairness or if, an issue of equity. But if you want to position that as an idea that's going to appeal to someone on the right end of the spectrum, you need to talk about how this deals with authority, loyalty, the notion of purity, the way society has been in the past, things we value as a community. So you can apply this in any number of things. Like if you take, for instance, climate change, climate change is 
well expressed to people on the right end of the, end of the spectrum when you talk about it in terms of technology, innovation, efficiency, doing what we as Western capitalist people do, which is find solutions to problems. Whereas if you want to communicate to someone who might be resistant to an issue of climate or sustainability on the left, let's say, for instance, you want to talk about nuclear power. You talk about how it's a, a far more fair, a far more equitable, far more sustainable approach to power. Um, even though studies will reveal people toward the left end of the spectrum are resistant to nuclear power as an idea, if you position it in a way that resonates with what they value, which typically is fairness and goodness, they're far more likely to be open to it. The tricky thing is you've got to get yourself into their shoes. Mm -hmm. You need to see the world from their perspective and genuinely think, okay, if I were them, what's the, what's the wording? What's the language? What's the tone that would resonate with me? Because if you just communicate in a way that makes sense to you, there's an inbuilt arrogance there that the way I see this makes sense to me, therefore you should see it too. And the harder you push, the more evidence and logic you pile on, the more they'll typically dig their heels in. But if it's in a way that resonates with their worldview, they'll be far more open to it. Yeah, fantastic, man. Look, we we basically ran out of time. I, I will say this is super interesting. There's a lot more in the book uh, that are just sort of rubber meets the road persuasion techniques. I'll go over a few in the show close that is not going to be on YouTube. That's always in the podcast feed. So if you're listening to this audio, you'll get that in a second. But, you know, oh, before I go, I will I, I got to say, I love that you finally were able to put your finger on something that I've known intuitively for a long time, which is things that rhyme seem to make more sense but that is misused by all these like BS self-help influencers, like how you do anything is how you do everything or whatever. And, and that that might be a bad example because it doesn't rhyme, but there's all these silly, clever catchphrases. And if you ever go to a, a, a seminar, uh, I won't name any names. You ever go to one of those popular self-help seminars, half of it is clever trite bullshit that rhymes or sounds good and makes zero sense when you hold it under the light. Yeah. And that the problem with that is our, our brains can, can, I guess they confuse fluency with accuracy. If something yeah. sounds right, if it's got a good syncopation, if it rhymes, not only is it more memorable, but we'll see it as more accurate or more reliable, even though it may have no basis to it at all. So, I mean, obviously if you've got a good message that is reliable, if you can make it rhyme, or make it have a, a poetic symmetry to it, it'll have more impact. So this is a tool you can use in a good way, but obviously if you're trying to dress up garbage, poor thinking, you know, sloganism, unfortunately you can have the same effect on something that really probably shouldn't be memorable or, or persuasive, but if it rhymes, it will be. Michael McQueen, thank you very much. We will link to the book in the show notes, of course. Please use our book links, folks, if you buy the books. JordanHarbinger.com slash books is where you can find them. This is a worthy read just because there's so much rubber meets the road. We didn't even get to a lot of it because, well, we didn't have three hours. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for checking out this entire episode on YouTube. If you want to follow up on this topic, check out our podcast feed or visit us on our website at jordanharbinger.com where you can learn more about our guest and dive even deeper into what we discussed today. And remember, YouTube is not the only place that you can check out the Jordan Harbinger Show. Any podcast app should have us. Check out the links in the description where you will find access to our shows that don't appear on YouTube, like Skeptical Sunday, where we debunk topics like crystal healing, GMOs, conspiracy theories, homeopathy, tipping, even lawns. To find out if they're by science and logic, or if they're just complete nonsense. Spoiler, many of them are complete nonsense. Also, our Feedback Friday shows where we help people escape from cults, get raises at work, and take all manner of questions from you, the audience, all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. And every episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show has something useful you can take away and apply in your own life and help you navigate what I know can often seem like the overwhelming and paralyzing challenges of modern life. Life can be hard, yes, but we are here to help. And if you appreciate how we help, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.